Welcome to Garden Success with Skip Richter, the show designed to help you have a bountiful garden and a beautiful landscape. Call in now with your lawn and garden questions at 979-845-5689 or email your questions to gardensuccess at tamu.edu. And now, Texas A&M AgriLife Extension horticulturist, Skip Richter. Well, hello. Welcome to Garden Success. We are glad you're listening. If you would like to give us a call or perhaps send me some photos to identify or diagnose something here, here's how you do it. You can call us at 979-845-5689, 845-5689, or you can send uh, photos by email, email questions to gardensuccess at tamu. Dot edu And due to time, I won't be able to type out uh, answers, extensive answers to email questions, but what I will do is answer on the air. So just keep listening in. If you should miss a show, you can listen to Garden Success via podcast. And the nice thing about that is uh, you catch something that you missed uh, or just kind of catch up and share Garden Success with other people you know. Maybe you know someone who would be interested in hearing this show. Well, now they can. Even if they don't live in the area, they have access to it. Uh, boy, do we ever have a lot, a lot of emails to go through today. Uh, so we're going to we're gonna start uh, working our way through uh, until we start talking to folks on the phone uh, here. Uh, someone was discussing with me, had a question uh, about some suckers on uh, live oaks, um, then wanting to remove them. Uh, you know, can you remove them anytime you want? And the answer is yes. I believe that was Tim. I may have uh, answered some of Tim's question last week. But um, when live oak suckers occur, well, when you see shoots at the base or near the base of a live oak trunk, they're coming out of the soil, but they're, they're near the base. Uh, that is probably suckers coming off the roots, actually sprouting coming off the roots. Uh, if, and the further you get away from the trunk, the less of that you see. There are two strains of live oaks primarily that we deal with here in the Bryan College Station area, Central Texas area. One of them is the Central Texas strain of live oaks, which you will find if you head out west of 35 into the hill country, where in the pastures you see mots of live oaks, a whole bunch of trunks coming up together in a little area, and then there'll be pasture and then another group of trunks. That is a mott forming kind of live oak and it suckers a lot or it sends up shoots a lot around the base. If you go along the Gulf Coast, Louisiana, Alabama, through those areas, uh, you see these big giant spreading live oaks, but not a whole bunch of, of groups, uh, uh, trunks clustered together. And that's a different type, same genus and species, just a different uh, version of the live oak, if you will. Uh, sometimes when we buy them and plant them in our yard, you don't exactly know where they came from, and so we often see this suckering problem. There's there's not a practical way to deal with them. To dig down and cut them away where they attach to the trunk is not practical when you're getting when you're getting a lot of those. To um, just cut them off, they're going to re-sprout again. Although you can do that. There are people that just mow when they mow. If there's grass going up and they just mow the grass, they mow the, the shoots as well and keep them in bounds that way. Uh, some people have used a really heavy duty row cover, uh, not row cover, ground cover fabric. The, the cloth that's black, that if you go to a garden center, you see it on the ground and they're setting pots of plants on it, that stuff. Uh, they'll put that all around the tree after they trim them all down to the ground. Uh, and then put something of weight. I've seen people use gravel and other things to just kind of hold that down, uh, river rock, whatever you would want to use. And so that primary area at least has a cover over it. Uh, that is a strategy that can be used as well. There are sprays that are growth regulator sprays. Um, there's one called Sucker Stopper. <laughs> That's a good name for it. Uh, that you can spray, and when you make a cut, like uh, crepe myrtles are really bad about when you cut a branch off that, that sprouts around the base, it just re-sprouts more. Uh, and so the Sucker Stopper kinds of sprays can help inhibit the regrowth of those, uh, not eradicate them by any means. I don't even know how long before you're starting to have it again, but uh, it's a temporary fix that you can use. Uh, so those are all some options for you. Uh, there's just not a, a really good solution other than basically one of the ones that I talked about. 
it would be helpful if we could determine when we're buying a live oak, you know, where did it come from? Where did the, 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 the garden center that sells it to you is not the one that grew it, of course. And so whoever got the seed and 99.9% .9 of live oaks are grown from seed, uh, probably higher than that. Uh, those seed that are collected uh, are going to be um, from somewhere. And if you could determine that, then you would know exactly, eh, let me buy one from more, a more of a Gulf, Co Gulf Coast source. It's, uh, it's probably the kind of live oak you're looking for anyway. So I hope that I hope that helps uh, clarify, you know, that uh, somewhat. I want to go into the emails again. Uh, by the way, our phone number is 979-845-5689. Today's a good day to be inside calling a radio show about gardening rather than outside actually doing your gardening. Uh, but we we just have to put up with this for a couple of days and it will be perfect again to, to uh, enjoy the temperatures uh, out, outside. Uh, let's see, the, another email that came in. Uh, Larry asked about an evergreen vine that will grow in shade to cover a privacy fence, a cedar fence. And they before had had things like um, Confederate jasmine. Uh, and uh, so those kinds of plants are a, a little bit of a problem. They are just massive in the amount of growth they put on for on a privacy fence. Uh, but they can be sheared. You can shear them regularly, and you essentially could have a, a one-foot-thick wall of Confederate jasmine just to take it really, really narrow. If you're faithfully shearing both sides, uh, you could keep it, you know, let's say, let's just be reasonable, say within a foot or two, uh, and do that. But I think he's wanting to get away from that and wanting to get away from uh, some of the other plants that uh, could also tend to be a little bit uh, overwhelming. Uh, and we do have some some great jasmines, really, really great jasmines that will work that way. Uh, but uh, to avoid that, what I would suggest uh, then is, Larry, you would consider, I don't know, there's a number of vines that would work pretty well. Uh, when we start, up at talking, start talking about covering a cedar privacy fence, you probably don't want to get something that's going to attach to the cedar itself. Some vines have little hold fasts. They can grow and attach to a brick wall as they grow. It's not tendrils. It's little little pads that reach out and glue themselves to the, to the fence, if you will. Uh, I'd rather not do that on a wood surface or even a painted wood surface, really. So what I would suggest is you consider putting some sort of a support structure for the vine up against the fence. Now, it could be just a regular piece of fence wiring, uh, some sort of thing you unroll there as an attachment. Uh, livestock panels are a possibility as well. Uh, put along the fence, and the vine would, would essentially twine and grow around those. And uh, so if you had to replace the fence, you could do that. Uh, or if you, yeah, it, it would just be something that you would have more access to and not just stuck in between the boards of the fence and increasing the the wetness and the eventual chance of decay on it. Uh, the cross vine called uh, Tangerine Beauty is really beautiful. It doesn't spread to make so much of a wall of foliage as some vines do, but it does spread. It's, it's a runner, and with, with some controlling and pruning, a little bit of guidance, you could make a nice wall of foliage out of a cross vine. The Tangerine Beauty is one of the most beautiful ones. There's a, a native version. It's kind of a yellow and maybe a brick red brown. Uh, the Tangerine Beauty has a beautiful tangerine color uh, to the blooms. Uh, I think it's by far more attractive, but it's not the native version. But uh, that would be one that I would try. There are other vines like that. Um, the um, Carolina Jessamine is another one that does well in some shade. Uh, it has yellow flowers that I believe parts of that plant are poisonous. So if there are little kids around, you probably wouldn't want to grow it. I don't know. Especially if they're not old enough to know don't run around sticking everything on earth in your mouth. Uh, I've got two-year-old golden retrievers that haven't learned that yet. Uh, but, but seriously, the uh, the Caroline Jessamine's a nice little vine. Not that and um, Tangerine Beauty Cross Vine are not fully evergreen, uh, they're, but they're close to it. Uh, those are ones that I think you would like. There are a few others out there, but every vine, every plant, 
every person <laughs> has their pros and cons. So there's no such thing as a perfect plant. Uh, everything has string, strong points and weak points. And so those are a couple that, that I would think about uh, if that would fit the bill for what you're trying to do. Again, our phone number, 979-845-5689, or by email, gardensuccess at T-A-M-U dot E-D-U, gardensuccess at T-A-M-U dot E-D-U. Uh, someone was asking me the other day, when do I plant tomato plants? Is it safe? Well, I, I broke my crystal ball years ago, so now I just have to give my best guess. Uh, but what we do is we talk about the average last frost date. And what that means is let's go back over the last 20 years or so and let's look at when did the last frost occur in 1992 and 3 and 2004 and you know every year since then when did the last frost and then what is the average of all those dates so what that tells you is just that on the average that's about when the last frost occurs, but what we should read from that is that will never be the last frost date. Now, it's not true that it'll never be, but it's good to recognize that that date is not magical. That is just looking back at history, and, and, and climate changes. Every year is different. There are no two years that are alike, and so I can almost guarantee you that the last frost will not be on the average date. It'll be before that or it'll be after that. And there's a 50-50 chance of each. That's the date when we say, okay, we're going to make a call and we're going to plant tomatoes or something else. Well, if you want to gamble a little bit and you want to get an earlier start on tomatoes, which is a good idea, we'll then do it before the last average frost date. And by the way, we are pretty much right on the last average frost date right now for the Bryan College Station area. If you go further south, it is later, and if you go further north, it is earlier. I'm, excuse me, vice versa in the spring. If you go further, further south, it's earlier. Further north, it's later. And uh, so I would plant the tomatoes. I plant mine early in most years. This year I haven't gotten around to it. But most years I plant mine early and then I just get ready to go out and cover them up when we have some cold weather. You know, tomatoes that have been living the life of Riley in a greenhouse or indoors if you're growing them yourself, uh, to go outside, it may be a 75 degree day, which is wonderful. But that night when it drops down to 52 degrees and the wind is blowing, that is really a shock, and the plants kind of get shocked, set back there. It won't kill them, but, but it sets them back. And sometimes I'll put a clear cover over the row using PVC to make hoops and make this, like, greenhouse tunnel, if you will. you got to open the ends up during the day because it gets way, way hot in there, just like your car does when the sun shines through the window. And so that would be another strategy. A lot of people aren't going to do that. It's like, come on, I ain't got time for that. I just got two tomato plants. Well, in that case, I would, you know, I would just wait and be a little careful. What I like to do as a general practice, and I'm doing it this year, is get your plants early if you want. The, the selection is best when they first come in, and they typically first come into places, especially certain pl kinds of places, way earlier than they should. Uh, it's just not tomato time. It's too early. It's too risky. But go ahead and buy them then. Bring them home, and let's say they were in a little six-pack one of the little tiny two-inch or inch-and-a-half wide cells, well, then put them in a four-inch pot and grow them for a while in really good light. It helps to have a little, some sort of a grow light under them. Uh, and then bump them up to a bigger pot and then a bigger pot. And, I mean, you can have gallon-sized tomatoes with fruit on them by the time it's time to plant if you want to do that. Uh, mine are bloom getting ready to bloom. My peppers already have bloom buds on them. And uh, I just have moved them up, gotten bigger pots, and they just keep growing. They're doing good. So when it is time to plant, rather than going and buying a little six-pack of plants, you're planting plants that are well on their way. It's like you planted them too early. In fact, they grew faster uh, under good light indoors. Uh, some, I moved mine yesterday, the day before. I had mine outside in, in a partial sun location because they were transitioning from indoors. And then tonight, uh, yesterday, later in the day, it was getting cool, and so I went ahead and brought them in. They'll be in for a couple of days, and they'll go back outside again. And when I get to planting them, they're just going to get bigger and better. They, you don't have to worry about watering them so often because they're getting in bigger and bigger containers as well. Uh, but anyway, that's just a strategy. It, more than one way to skin a cat, as they say, and uh, that is one thing you can do. So when do you plant? Well, on average, we're at, we're there. 
I would let this cold spell get by uh, where we get our night times up above the mid 50s and then go ahead and put those things out and I think you'll I think you'll have good good success with them. We had a question uh, come in by email uh, from uh, Dana or Dana and uh, around the house there are these little areas that are in between the foundation and maybe sidewalks around the house and whatnot that are filled with rocks and they're kind of a drainage type area and uh, she was looking for some things to plant are there any flowers that you could plant instead in those areas and yes if if uh, you can determine how much sunlight the area gets then you can know exactly what your flower options are for example if it was shady all the time uh, impatiens and caladiums would be color options in those areas if it gets at least a half a day sun, some salvias would do okay in there. Uh, and there are other plants that would do okay in a half day sun. Uh, there are some beautiful foliage and there's some beautiful flowers that could go in those areas. If it is more than a half day sun in that area, then you could even plant, uh, you, your palette grows by some additional plants as well. It kind of depends on what you want to look at, Dana. If you want to if you want something low growing like a bedding plant, do you want something about knee high or do you want even a, a larger shrub type flowering plant in those areas? There's options for all of that. And so there's a lot of, you kind of almost need a, a little checklist, a little order slip where you say it's sun, it's shade, it's part shade, and I want flowers, I want foliage, I want evergreen, I don't care if it's evergreen. Uh, I want it to get a six inches high, a foot high, 18, 36 inches high and uh, the sun is morning sun or afternoon sun and when you do all that then you come down to the best options that you would have so i'd need a lot i'd need a lot more information to go beyond that a good garden center could direct you to the plants that would provide that specific spots needs and to, or that would thrive in that specific spots needs but yes you could do that now you made a, a statement that that they were drainage areas and so if that stays soggy wet there's another checkbox on that order form. Uh, if it drains well, you can plant a lot of things in there. If it's a little moist at times, okay, that changes the palette a little. And then if it stays pretty wet uh, for longer periods of time after a rain just because of the drainage of water, then we're having to go to a whole different kind of plants. Then something like a Louisiana iris, which will grow in a swamp uh, if it's shady in that spot. Would, would be an option there. So see what I'm talking about? There's, there's a, lot of, a lot of specifications that will determine what plants will do best. But the basic answer to what you have is yes. If the area is a little too wet, you could put some sort of boxed sides on it. It could be treated lumber. It could be naturally rot-resistant lumber. You build a box there and you fill it with a quality soil mix. And then even if the area itself gets a little wet, you, you have a, a nicer soil above that where uh, it is going to be better drained and that would be another technique for getting a head start. We're listening to Garden Success and our phone number is 979-845-5689. 979-845-5689 or you can email me at gardensuccess at tamu.edu garden success at tamu dot edu so if you um, have some sort of a question that a photo would help on and boy do photos ever help a lot uh, sometimes they get questions and uh, you know someone will be describing something and my brain just is like I that does not make any sense at all and then they send a photo and it's like oh that's what you're okay so photos are really helpful um, so it's kind of a thing where how accurate do you want the answer to be? Well, based on the symptoms, like you call your doctor. Doctor, I don't feel well today, and he writes you a prescription. Wouldn't you kind of doubt the prescription based on I don't feel well today? <laughs> that that could be a lot of things that make you not feel well today. But the more information you get, then the better prescription you get. I, I'm not a doctor, but uh, that at least would uh, be an analogy I think that holds pretty true. Uh, the more information you give me, the better answer I give you. So let's uh, let's go back to the emails. Um, Dana also sent a picture of some crumbly brown things in the mulch. And when you look at it, it's these little, they're almost like spheres uh, that are brown and uh, they're crumbling apart. And what that is is a decomposer fungi. 
Now there are a bazillion different kinds of fungi out in nature. I mean a bazillion. And some types cause plant disease. But that's not the majority of fungi in nature. A lot of types, their job is to turn organic matter back into soil. When you walk through the forest and you see a fallen log and those little shelf fungi sticking out from it, that's what they're doing. They're taking the carbonaceous, woody, lignin materials and things in the log and they are rotting it away as a food substrate for them and it ends up becoming part of the forest floor, which is, over time, a wonderful thing for any plant that wants to grow there. Uh, when you put mulch out in your garden beds, we have a number of uh, common cast of characters that appear that are decomposer fungi. I don't know the name of the one you sent. I don't have a specific name for it, but I can tell you that's what it is. Don't worry about it. There's one that's called scrambled egg fungus, and it literally looks like you drop scrambled eggs on the mulch. It comes as a crust over the mulch, just this crusty scrambled egg looking thing on top of the mulch. There are some that are stink horns and they stick up like a horn and they smell stinky, stinky, stinky. That is another one. There's another one. Uh, let's see, what time is it? Uh, yeah, we're past lunch. It's called the dog vomit virus, <laughs> uh, fungus. And it looks like your dog threw up on the ground. It, that is a fungus growth. And so there's just a lot. There's others that when you grab the mulch, it's like it's all in a crusty shell. You pick it up and there's all this white, it's mycelial growth, fungal strands that are holding it together. All of those are okay. Don't worry about them. The, the last one I mentioned can kind of create a hydrophobic coating over the surface where water doesn't soak in as well. But all you got to do is take your old spade and fork or hoe or anything and just kind of break that up a little bit and it'll be just fine. So don't worry about them. I know I'm answering more of a question than you asked, but, you know, if I said, well, this is what yours is, someone who has the scrambled egg fungus is going to go, well, I wonder what mine is. Well, it's the same thing. Lots of those things going on. In fact, the same happens in our yard. Have you ever seen fairy rings, the little round circles of white toadstools in the yard? That's a fungus that is basically decomposing the organic matter at the soil surface, the thatch, and the, some of it below the surface a little bit. And it works its way through the thatch. And think of a wildfire spreading outward, like you threw a match into your yard and then it starts to burn and go outward. Well, that's the mycelial growth. And when certain conditions change, uh, it could be temperature, it could be moisture, whatever, you get this, it, it fruits and it sends up all these fungi out there at the perimeter where it, where it is actively spreading. And you get a circle or a circle-ish area. And then it can go out a little further. It can do that again even. But those are, again, a decomposer fungi. They're not a disease of your lawn. They serve no purpose other than if you're a golfer, it is really fun to get out there and whack them and send them across uh, to the neighbor's yard or something. It's, they, they Don't worry, you're not infecting your neighbor when you do that. Our phone number is 979-845-5689. It's kind of quiet on the phone today. Either you are just listening happily or I misjudged you and you are actually diligent at work outside in your garden, which hats off to you if you're doing that. Uh, Desiree had a question about some holes in a Mexican white oak trunk. And when you look at the picture, what you see is a a tree trunk and there are little holes and they are about the size of a pencil eraser and they're in lines and they're only about the depth of a pencil eraser and that's the damage caused by a bird called a sapsucker it's a type of woodpecker but this particular bird will go up to the tree and it'll peck just deep enough to get into the living phloem tissues on the outside there of the trunk and it, that will cause a little bit of bleeding and then it comes back and it can feed on sap on those little holes that it made. That does not hurt the tree. It doesn't do any good. Anytime you wound a tree is, you know, you don't have to, you shouldn't do it. But these birds you're not going to get rid of unless you can talk a neighborhood cat into hanging out uh, attached to the side of that tree trunk to, to run the birds away. Uh, it, it, trees live with it. They do just fine. You see these on a lot of oaks. You see these on pecan trees a lot. 
Uh, there are other trees that will get them. But one way is it almost looks like someone took a machine gun and strafed across the tree uh, the little lines of holes. These aren't just random holes here and there. They, they are lined up. And Desiree, that's what it is. I wouldn't worry about it. Uh, it's not a big problem, but in looking at the tree, I can tell you uh, we're hitting the end of winter and it's time to do pruning and you should clear out those limbs. Um, when you look at branches on a tree, when you are trying to prune a tree and you're trying to decide, it's a young tree, and you're trying to decide, well, how high up do I prune the branches off the trunk? And after that, how far apart do I prune them? Imagine those branches when the tree is mature, not as old as it gets, but getting mature. Well, on a, on a giant tree uh, like a live oak, or in your case, a Mexican white oak, you know, those branches could be 8 inches, 10 inches, 12 inches uh, across. And so when they start off 4 inches apart, that's not good. And so once a branch reaches about the size of a golf ball, I would take it off. And that way you can make a clean cut that will heal fast. Uh, if you know a branch doesn't have a future, some of these little pencil-sized things on the trunk of your tree, I would prune those off right now. Uh, but in general, uh, you want to separate them out when you imagine that little, what's now maybe a golf ball-sized branch, being 8 inches across. Well, then you know another branch has to be at least a foot apart, and it really should be further than that apart on the trunk. So just a little extra tip. Uh, we're going to go to the phones now and talk to Gary. Hello, Gary. Hey, Skip. Uh, I have a question about tomato and pepper seedlings. So I started some tomatoes and peppers uh, back in January, and I went to go plant my tomatoes this past weekend. And when I took them out of the pots, they had no roots. I mean, okay. very minimal root growth. I looked it up, and I think it might be because of a lack of uh, heat. Uh, I kept them in my garage, and I didn't have enough room on my uh, seed warming mats, and so some of them were off of those. I'm wondering, uh, I ended up going to buy some tomatoes at the local nursery, but I'm wondering if with these peppers that I have, if, do you think that I could uh, promote root growth between now and when I need to go plant those, or should I consider just buying transplants at this no, point? No, I think you're okay. Let me ask, when you look at the root system and you pull it out of the pot, first of all, how big is the pot that they're in right now? How wide across the top? Four-inch four pots. Four-inch, okay. When you look at the outside of the four-inch pot, are you seeing no white roots or just a few white roots on the outside? Or no, are you seeing roots no that white are roots. brown? Or, okay. I think that's too much water. Uh, or it okay. could have been a temporary drought where the roots literally died on the outside, and on the inside they some survived. So the plants, the plants look okay, or, or, or just not growing a lot, or what? Yeah, they look okay uh, in terms of color. Some have a little bit of, uh, you know, discoloration. They look a little yellow. Okay. Um, but yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm looking at the roots on one of them now, and they, yeah, uh, they seem like they're all within like a two inch okay. like root zone. Okay, well, let, let me talk about the temperature. When you're trying to sprout seed, temperature is really important to get that seed sprouting quickly and up where it, what, you know, something could happen in three to four days instead of in 10 days, you know, because the temperature is better. But once the plant's growing, the soil temperatures are in the 50s. And so roots are used to colder temperatures, you know, and so I, I don't, I wouldn't worry a lot once a plant is getting going about the roots, although warming it, especially early in the life of that seedling, will speed it up. Uh, so I think what we, you just main thing you need to watch for is that it's too wet. Uh, you can do a couple of things. In a four inch pot, you can take a little sharpened pencil, uh, a freshly sharpened because you want the wood surface to be dry uh, and not have the hand the oils from your fingers and stuff, you know, coating it. Uh, and then stick it down in the pot, and when you pull it up, number one, you'll see wetness on the wood of the pencil because it will have soaked in. But you'll also see little pieces of soil sticking to it, indicating it's moist, and then you don't need to water. Uh, hold off on watering. Let Don't let your plants get totally wilted, but, but let it dry out a little bit between waterings. I would get a soluble plant food solution and mix it at the lowest label rate, the absolute lowest, and then use that every time you water these plants. 
they may also be struggling from a lack of adequate light or, or quality light with the right wavelengths and stuff. And that can be fixed, especially at this point in time, by just taking them outside during the day. You know, any time the temperature is above 55 or 60 degrees, just getting them out in better light and eventually full sun, uh, I think uh, you can re rescue these plants and keep them going. Okay, yeah, that would be great. I uh, have been watering them pretty diligently. I was kind of worried about them drying out. And so, uh, yeah, I think you might be right there. I'll pro I've been trying to keep them kind of wet constantly looking yeah. at the, uh, the top level of soil. So, right. yeah, I'll let them uh, dry out a little bit, and I'll use that pencil trick to make sure I'm not uh, watering too frequently. Yeah, that's a good way with house plants and everything. And you can sit it, you know, I'll, I'll stick mine down two inches in a, let's say it's a bigger pot um, of a house plant. I'll stick it a couple of inches and look at it, and then I'll go down about four inches and look at it, and then down to the bottom of the pot even, and just kind of get an idea of where is it really moist. Not soggy, but moist. And, and then you can water accordingly. All right. Well, All Gary, right. thank you for the Don't call. Think... Good luck with those. All right. Thanks. You bet. Take care. We're going to go back to the phones. Our number is 979 845 5689. We're going to talk to Tim. Hello, Tim. Hi, Skip. Um, I've got a question for you about a couple of uh, young uh, live oaks. My uh, my father-in-law has just built a new house in College Station, and um, as I understand it, the, uh, the city required that the landscapers plant some new trees in the front yard. Mm -hmm. uh, the house has just been completed, and uh, the trees were planted this week. These are uh, probably six, seven foot tall live oaks, about two two inch um, uh, uh, trunks. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, normally you'd plant a tree like that around here, or I guess anywhere, uh, before the winter. Mm -hmm. uh, and these had to be planted now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so what we're wondering is is uh, whether there's any 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 anything special we should do. Uh, that we would have that, to, to do differently than uh, than if we'd uh, planted these before the winter. Yeah. Uh, um, so, j first of all, is the first thing you need to do is get a mental picture of what's underground and what is underground. And this is obvious, but people forget it. Is you have a cylinder of roots, you know, like a, a fez <laughs> hat. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, mm -hmm. it's just a cylinder that went in the ground, and that's where all the roots still are. And just outside that mm -hmm. is the soil. And the soil can be moist, but on a warm day, that tree's whole root system is in that little cylinder, and it will pump that dry. And that's why at the garden center or the nursery, they may have been watered it twice a day in the summer uh, when it was being grown to keep it mm -hmm. adequately hydrated. So when we get into warmer weather, certainly by April and May, uh, you're going to need to be watering that as if it were still sitting in a container on top of the ground. Uh, and d you don't want to overwater it. And if it's in a clay soil, the soil itself can become a underground bathtub, the whole water. And so you don't yeah. want to do that. But there's 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 an, a, a gradual time where you do need to soak it uh, in that area. And what I often will use is a donut-shaped dam of soil in a circle around the plant. Just think of it as a mound of soil raised up. Oh, if you could get up about four inches or so, that'd be good, because it's going to settle. And then when you fill it, let's say you put two inches of water in, a, in one of those, it all has to mm -hmm. soak straight down instead of run off. And, and that way you know you're getting a watering to the roots, and, and that dam would be mm -hmm. bigger than the root cylinder that went in the ground, you know, maybe three feet across right now. Mm -hmm. uh, but that would help. There are other ways you can provide slow soakings. Uh, there are gadgets you can buy. Uh, one's called a gator bag. It goes around the tree. You fill it with water and has little leaking holes at the bottom. So it gradually waters the base of the tree. Uh, that's a strategy. Uh, in a pinch, I've used five-gallon buckets with tiny, tiny holes drilled in them set beside the yeah, tree. I've done that too. Mm -hmm, on each side, and that'll give you a slow drip, uh, especially if you seal the bottom of the bucket so it doesn't just go out of the bucket and run off as if it were coming out of a water hose. Uh, so whatever you use to give it a good so slow soaking this first summer, when it really heats up and we're in the 90s, you need to be watering it probably every other day um, in in the first summer season. 
at least twice a week. Uh, and then as we get further into the season, uh, you may back off to, to twice a week uh, or eventually once a week. And then once a tree is established after a year, year and a half, uh, you shouldn't have to worry about that. But there's two things you're, you're trying to do. One is keep it alive, and that takes mm -hmm. less water less often. And the other is to make it thrive so that you can hang a hammock in it sooner rather than later. And so I wouldn't think about in terms of how do I keep it from dying. I would think in terms of how do I make it so happy that uh, I get double the growth <laughs> in the next four years that mm -hmm. I would have otherwise. Anything besides water that I should be thinking about? Water's primary. Uh, you can fertilize. That's helpful. Uh, I would mm -hmm. say once it's well established, so let's give it at least eight weeks, at least two months to get some roots going. Then you can begin to fertilize using your lawn fertilizers. They're, they're an excellent product for tr promoting tree growth. And mm, uh, okay. you, you go up to your trunk. I think you said these were two-inch trunks, or what, what did you say? Yeah. Okay. Mm, so for every inch of trunk diameter, give it one or two cups of fertilizer. So as the size they are now, that would be two to four cups of fertilizer. So either a pint or a quart of fertilizer. Sprinkled, not just at the base, of course, but in a wider circle around the, the plant and watered in well. And you could do that, you could do that, let's say, when were they planted again? Just this week. This week, okay. Mm -hmm. So, I would I'd probably do that toward the end of April, the first time, and then I would do it again probably in June. Uh, as long as you're giving it water, you can keep uh, growth coming. Uh, for this first year. Mm. You could even wait a little longer. All, All right. right. All right. That's Good. very helpful. Thank you. You, thank you very much. You take care and thank you for the call. I appreciate that. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Uh, let's see. Our phone number is 979-845-5689, 845-5689, or by email, gardensuccess at tamu. Dot edu garden success at tamu.edu. Suzanne writes and says that uh, are there more weeds this year than in previous years? Uh, they're they're dealing with a lot more, not only numbers of weeds, but the variety of weeds in the yard. Uh, and they tried a, a, a pre-emergent and uh, was wondering, uh, you know, what what's going on and what do we do? Well, first of all. Pre-emergence prevent the weed seeds from coming up. So the weeds you see now would have been cool season weeds that germinated uh, at the end of September, early October, mid-October last year. So if you used a pre-emergent before that time uh, and you still have weeds, it probably was a product that didn't control the kinds of weeds you have. But more likely, it got you got it down a little late uh, for that. Uh, right now, we are really, you get it done pretty soon, it's time to get a pre-emergent down for summer weeds like grass spurs and crabgrass and, and other warm season weeds. And when you put a pre-emergent down, it's very important that you put it at the right rate. There's a reason that there's a, a and I'm not lecturing you, Suzanne, I just see so many people do it wrong. So I'm saying this for everybody else that's listening out there. Uh, there is a mindset, and I think us guys are worse, even than our uh, lady friends and spouses and whatnot are, and that is that if a teaspoon is good, a tablespoon is better. You know, rather than just kill it, I'm going to kill it more dead. And uh, when we use pesticides that way, uh, number one, there's a reason that the label says what it says. Now think about this. If you made an insecticide or if you made a herbicide, wouldn't you want to sell as much of it as you can? So if a teaspoon was enough, wouldn't you want to put a tablespoon on the label? Because then you would sell a lot more, three times as much of that product, uh, and you would make more money. So why don't they do that? They do that because research says... Uh, and I'm going to go back to pre-emergence specifically, that there's a certain amount of various ingredients that you find in pre-emergence that are effective in stopping the weeds. But when you overdo it, not only do you, can you do environmental damage, it wash off in creeks, there are some of the products that uh, uh, dicamba, uh, atrazine are examples 
that can actually cause damage to woody ornamentals that are in your property because you overdose them. I saw a yard one time where someone had a, a weed and feed product that was had a pre-emergent and they applied it across the yard and then they had extra so hey I bought it so they just started their way back across the yard keeping on going so half of the yard, part of the yard was getting doubled and they stopped when they ran out which happened to be right underneath the tree and when I came out on site you could look at that tree and you could draw a line through it of normal tree and tree that was bleaching yellow due to the kind of herbicide they were using and so is a tablespoon better? No, a tablespoon does damage. And if you have a St. Augustine lawn, the, the runners are dropping roots off the nodes on the runners into the soil. And when your grass is struggling with drought, when it's fighting take all root rot, it is very important to get new roots down in that soil to help sustain growth. And if you have an overdose of a pre-emergent herbicide on the soil surface in your lawn, I've been to lawns, where they had doubled or tripled their applications and you could pick up the runners and there's no roots stuck to the ground. It's like the root hits the ground and it stubs off. They call it a clubbed root. It can't get in the ground. And so as a result, they were killing their grass by not letting the grass get a root in the ground. It's not like the product doesn't in and of itself kill the grass. It's, it's preventing the grass from rooting this particular set of uh, pre-emergence. And so their grass was struggling with take all root rot and drought and other things, but couldn't get any roots in the ground to, to help sustain growth. And so a tablespoon is not better if it says a teaspoon. It doesn't make sense. The company wouldn't do that. They don't want the liability of doing that. And even though they'd like to sell more product, they don't. And there's a reason for it. And so we really need to recognize the label is the law and the label is there for a reason. And so, I, Suzanne, I have wandered off your question, but this is a soapbox for me because I see people destroy or greatly weaken or open the door to diseases like take all root rot that can be stress in, induced. Uh, and I, I just, you know, this is my PSA. Beware. So back to your weeds. Uh, Pre-emergents have to be put on at the right rate and the right time, and they have to be the right product for the weeds you're trying to control, or they have to be a product that controls both grassy and broadleafs very well. And so when you do that, the next thing is they have to be watered in, and that moves the product into the soil surface where it immediately ties up. These are designed to not wash through the soil, uh, preferably, but to tie up to the soil so that when a weed tries to sprout, that seed comes out and the same thing I just said would happen to your St. Augustine if you if you nuke it with the product uh, happens to the weed seed. It tries to put a root out, it, that root gets stopped and cannot develop and that weed seed desiccates and dies and you never see the weed. That's how a pre one of the ways a pre-emergent can work. So. Uh, timing would be important. Now's the timing for, for warm season. Now, as far as why so many this year, uh, the, the reason is, uh, one reason is that uh, every year that you allow weeds to go to seed, you get 200 times as much the next year. That's a just a seat of the pants shot, okay? Some weeds literally make, uh, there. I think there's some amaranths that can do like 200,000 seeds from one plant. It, you know, the big old giant pigweed plant. But the point is weeds make a lot of seeds. And so if they have one year that they can do that, you're going to see a dramatic increase on whatever weeds were allowed to do that. And so that is a reason. Another reason is last summer was brutal on our lawns. It killed lawns outright. Uh, it uh, For other lawns, it weakened them weakened them to the point that they lost foliage density and wherever sunlight hits the soil nature plants a weed just remember that uh, and so now we have thinner grass therefore more sun hitting the soil so the weed seeds that are there rather than being shaded out by your dense lawn now have the chance to grow so a combination of all those factors is why we're seeing a lot of weeds and you're going to see a lot of weeds this summer everybody's got a lawn that struggled uh, I would just be aware that I would expect that because thin lawns have 
much increased weed problems. Now, in the densest St. Augustine that you can have, you can still have weed problems. I'm not saying the density fixes every weed, but it takes a huge percentage of the weeds out of the picture when you have lawn density. Some uh, dichondra, um, the um, um, dollar weed, uh, Virginia buttonweed, especially in all those in moist areas, they can survive with St. Augustine even in its density. But most weeds, most weed problems don't. Uh, and so when people say, what is the best thing I can do for weed, con use for weed control? I say, well, before you use something for weed control, you need to, you need to apply three things, mowing, watering, and fertilizing. And when you mow, water, and fertilize right, you get a dense lawn and you drop your weed problems down to a fraction of what they would have been. Then we'll talk about what to spray on the weeds that you have. Can you tell that's a soapbox? It is. Been doing, I've been in extension, I was in extension 35 years before my retirement, December 31st. And I'm just telling you, uh, I'd run out of fingers and toes counting all the yards that I went to where the principles I just talked about were not observed. And as a result, uh, they had lots and lots of problems. People want to blame the products, uh, but I would blame the applicator in most cases. That that is surely a problem. Okay, I lost track of where I was. Well, I got time for another phone call. If you'd like to give us a call at 979-845-5689, 979-845-5689, or by email at gardensuccess at tamu dot edu garden success at tamu dot edu and we're running a little short on time to email for today but i will get back to them uh, next week if i don't get to your email today if you email late um, so uh, let's see we had a question come in from rick and rick's been hearing about mulch 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 compost 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 he bought a load of compost this week and smelled a little bit like ammonia when he unloaded it in the garden and w so he was wondering you know is this going to burn plants uh, they're, not all composts are created equal. A good quality compost has a fresh, earthy smell. And a, a compost that has been composted anaerobically, meaning the pile was not well aerated, that pile of compost, there are often some toxic kinds of compounds that can occur that can damage plants. Now, ammonia in and of itself isn't the worst. There are some other odors that are very foul that I would be more worried about. I would give your compost a little time to air out, or if you mixed it into the soil, just give it a little bit of time before you go in and planting. I think you should be just fine. But what you've been hearing, mulch, 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 compost, 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 is true. Uh, that Of all the products on the market, the miracle cures, the snake oils, the stuff that works, all that stuff, uh, the best product in the world uh, is compost for your soil, for your plants. And for weed control, the best product in the world is mulch. And those that both occur naturally. You can make them yourself by chipping branches, by composting organic matter like leaves and things. Uh, I probably haul home a 100 or 200 bags of leaves every cool season to my yard, grind them up so I can store them in big old com um, uh, contractor bags outside of the sunlight so they don't break up, uh, and use them all through the year for making compost, for walkway materials, and for mulching. Uh, and it's free. It's free. Your neighbors are so kind, they bag them for you. So don't be rude. Go pick them up and take them home. Uh, we are now going to, let's see, we got a phone num uh, phone call from Robert. Let's talk to Robert. Hello, Robert. Hello. Got a tree planting question. I try to plant a new tree uh, every year. Uh, I've run out of room on my lot, and so I've got some area... It's an easement, a uh, abandoned road easement, so I'm not spending a lot of money putting trees in there because they may try, they may decide to clear cut the whole thing. Yeah. But I did buy a pecan tree, which I've never spent a lot of money on before. So the question is, what's a good? It's going to be in the full sun. It's a drainage area, so it's kind of low. Okay. And I can, I've got a choice of uh, a really wet place or a not so wet place okay. or a pecan tree so what would you recommend uh, am i going to have any success it's kind of a wet area 
when uh, it does rain. Pecans do not. But it drains. Okay. Well, drainage is the key. Pecans don't like swamps, and they won't grow oh, in swamps. Okay. There's actually a native cousin of the pecan that that will grow in soggy soils, but none of the trees you buy are, are grafted onto that. Uh, the the pecans need alluvial well-drained soil. So if you were to ask a pecan, what do you want? It would say, I want a sandy loam soil, that a loamy soil that is 20 feet deep to the water table. <laughs> wow. And so they can, it can get a root down and have dependable water. That's why you see them on river bottoms all through Texas. Okay, yeah. That is pecan heaven. Uh, that's all... That soil along a river bottom has been deposited by the river, taking topsoil away from other places and putting it on that property, and uh, yeah. th that's pecan heaven. So if you if you can give it better drainage, that's good. Now, if it's a heavy black okay. clay, the performance won't be as good as it would have been on okay. a river bottom soil. But you can make them grow. I mean, it, they, they will grow. They just, their vigor and whatnot will be less. But definitely okay. avoid avoid the swamp. Okay. So the higher, the better. Probably the higher, or the more better. Drained, the better. Yeah, the more the more well drained. And and here's what I would do, um, uh, Robert. If I if I were you, if you can get a post hole digger or something, even a sharpshooter, tar harder work with a sharpshooter, but dig a hole. If you could dig it two feet deep, straight down, that would be best. Uh, if you can at okay. least get it a foot and a half, uh, and then you fill it up with water. Get a big old five gallon bucket or a hose and just fill it to the top with water because our soil is moist right now. And you don't yeah. want to do this when the soil is powder dry. Fill it up with water, sit, look at your clock, and check it in eight hours. Ideally, it would be all drained out of that hole. Check it again in uh, another, let's say, four or six hours, let's maybe eight, 14 hours or so down. See how it looks. Check it at 24 hours. Check it at 48 hours. And if it doesn't drain until 24 that's kind of the line of where this is really not the best of all places okay. for pecans. Uh, if it doesn't drain in 48, the answer is absolutely not. Okay. Uh, but you there is like a lot of clay here. Yeah. But I have a neighbor with uh, two huge pecan trees in his backyard, so I'm somewhat okay. encouraged by it. Yeah. So I'm going to try. Yeah, and all this stuff on plants is never just black and white. You know, I say yeah, it should right. drain in 24 hours. Well, there's nothing magic about 24 hours. It's just... Uh, you know, that the best, if, if you were wanting to put in a pecan orchard, I would not put it in a place that doesn't drain in 24 oh, no. hours. Well, uh, I, I'm just trying this one because uh, pecan trees are pretty smart. They they don't get frozen back like some. They they wait yes. till uh, it's it's time to put on leaves. Yeah, they are smart. I don't expect to get any pecans. I just want a nice big shade tree. No, but if you are a hunter, you can get some of the best squirrel meat in the world <laughs> if you plant a pecan tree. You'll never enjoy the pecan, but pecan-fed squirrel is really good eating, I'm told. I got plenty of squirrels <laughs> already. <laughs> Robert, take care. Thank you for calling. You betcha. Today. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> Uh, we actually have time for one more phone call if somebody would like to, 979-845-5689. Uh, We're here every Thursday, by the way, from 12 to 1 here on Garden Success. And so uh, I hope you'll listen in, tell your neighbors about the show, and uh, give us a call. Let's talk about the things that are of interest to you. That's always it's always a good thing to get out and, and about and be, you know, seeing things that are going on. Um when is the Home and Garden Show here this year? I think that's coming up real quick, isn't it? I don't have that on my calendar. I should, but I don't. It's coming up real soon. I know the Master Gardeners are going to have a booth out there. Uh, and if you have gardening questions, that would be a great way to get them answered. Uh, go out and visit when we have our Home and Gardening Show here. Uh, and uh, talk to the Master Gardeners. Bring them samples, bring them pictures, and they will get you straightened out and on the right track. We're going to go to the phones now and talk to Brian. Hello, Brian. Hey, Skip. Uh, appreciate the show. Listen every chance I get, but I emailed you a couple weeks ago and haven't had. A, I've been out of town. Uh, I was one of those that got hit hard uh, last year uh, in Pebble Creek as far as the lawn. Got hit both with the take-all root rot uh, patch uh, fungus as and then a month or two later with chinch bugs. Okay. So I've got to resod a lot of my yard. And first question, and I know you're running out of time, is uh, do I resod with uh, St. Augustine or go to Bermuda or something else if, you know, there are large areas of the yard that need resodded? Okay. Second, 
Sec secondly, real quick, is uh, when when do I start sodding? Uh, do I need to the rest of the lawn aerate or do anything different with the rest of the lawn? Tell me a little bit about that. All right, I see your question, uh, Brian. Uh, so, uh, take all root rot can affect um, Bermuda grass and zoysia grass too. So that disease in and of itself is you're not going to get away from it by switching uh, cultivars. Uh, Bermuda is the most drought tolerant of the group, meaning that if you did have a serious drought and could not get the lawn watered or didn't want to spend the money on it, uh, it would have a better chance of bouncing back than the St. Augustine would. Uh, and zoysia is kind of in the middle, I guess, and, and it depends on which cultivar of all these you're growing. Uh, but most St. Augustines need about an inch of water a week uh, or somewhere in that range when we're in the heat of summer to do their to do their best. Uh, chinch bugs, there is a St. Augustine that doesn't uh, suffer from chinch bugs like the others do, but it's not the kind that makes the lawn quality you probably want. So switching over to Bermuda or Zoysia would be an option for that. Uh, Bermuda and Zoysia, to look their best, need to be mowed low. And the lower you mow, the more frequently you mow. Uh, and again, the extreme is uh, that a golf course green gets mowed every day. But that's how it's made. And that's why it turns into that incredible surface, a uh, smooth surface. Um, if you um, can mow those two, Bermuda and Zoysia, at about two inches, two and a half inches maybe. Uh, you can get by with them there and have a really nice lawn. As you get lower, you have to switch over to a reel type mower as opposed to propeller blade type mower. Uh, but at about two and a half inches, two inches, you could probably get by with a propeller blade if the lawn is reasonably level, smooth. Um, so those would be your options as far as when. Uh, I like to wait until the grass is ready to hit the ground running. I mean, people sod and sodding two weeks ago, three weeks ago. But that grass isn't growing roots. And you bring in grass with a little half inch long root attached to the half inch of black clay soil that it comes with. And uh, it's just kind of sitting there. And I'd rather wait until it's really ready to, re ready to grow. And that's going to come uh, actually early, early April would be a good time uh, for that. Uh, I would sod in March if you need to. But that, that's the pros and cons of those, uh, Brian. Great. I'm, Great. I'm, I appreciate your help. Yeah, as I, always. I appreciate your call. Thank you very much. Uh, appreciate that. Well, you're listening to Garden Success. We'll be back next Thursday from 12 to 1. Hey, by the way, remember, when you email me, I will answer on the air. So uh, don't uh, wait for a typed-out answer. Uh, just with time allotments, my fingers can't quite pull that off. Uh, but we do appreciate your emails. I'm going to go back in time. I know we got some older ones as, as when I started back in live again. And we will catch up on those over time. So if you emailed like two weeks ago or, or more ago, well, just be patient. We'll be back. Thanks for listening to Garden Success. We are glad to help you with all kinds of things. Don't forget, too, you have a county AgriLife Extension office in every county that can hear this show. In fact, every... Uh, 250 counties of Texas have an actual office in the county where people can help you with your lawn and garden questions. You've been listening to Garden Success with Texas A&M AgriLife Extension horticulturist Skip Richter. Join us again next week as Skip discusses your questions about gardening and landscaping in the Brazos Valley.